Welcome to 99 Problems, but my biz ain't one. I'm James Fenimore, at James Fenimore underscore is my social. You can get me pretty much on any of the social media accounts. You could DM me there as well, or you could email us, info at Fenterprises.com. That's Enterprises with an F, like Fenimore. Uh, you could email me there, any of the questions. This is where we answer all your business questions. But first, we'd like to do a message of the day. Today, I want to talk to you about imposter syndrome. This has been coming up in a lot of my sessions lately. I don't know what's going on. I think this has probably been going on forever, but maybe today of all, of, of all times, there's just something going on in the water where people aren't confident anymore. Or maybe it's always been this way. I don't know. But I know it's been coming up a lot lately, and I want to talk to you about it. Imposter syndrome is a very real thing, and I understand it, but it's not necessary. People are, are, are telling me, you know, they're going for a promotion, but they don't feel they, they deserve it or they're not real. They, they, you know, I'm not I'm not a salesperson, so I, I can't sell or, you know, I'm not a CEO, so I shouldn't consider myself a C, you know, go, going for a CEO position or a manager position, whatever it is. A fry cook. I've never I've never been a fry cook. I shouldn't be a fry cook. How do you think people became these things, right? A CEO wasn't born a CEO. A salesperson wasn't born a salesperson, although I'm sure you've heard a million times, I oh, was born to be a salesman. Nobody came out a CEO, a boss, an owner. Nobody came out that way. They had to work to become that. They had to learn to become that. They had to fail to become that. So if you know you're going to put the work in and you know you have the drive to achieve these things, guess what? You're halfway there. So put your hat in the ring. If somebody's offering you the promotion, don't let the imposter syndrome take over. Understand you're being recognized as somebody that is that person in your manager's eyes, in your boss's eyes, in the owner's eyes. They're saying, you may not see it in you, but I do. And I recognize you are that person. You can be that person. That's special. And you know what? If you want to go after that, maybe maybe you're not being offered a position, right? But you want to be go for a manager role or you want to go open your own business. Okay, you see that in yourself. And maybe the imposter syndrome creeps in every now and then. Oh, uh, doing my, my own books is, is too hard or or I, I've never I've never had to like go out and, and make my own sales. I, I've always worked on the back end of things. Listen. If you have the drive and you have the commitment and you know you're going to put the work in, do it. Don't let that take over. That's nonsense. You're going to learn along the way. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures along the way. But when you treat those as education, when you treat those as part of the process, it's a good thing eventually. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stink in the moment. I'm not going to tell you, oh, I made a mistake. This is great. No, it's going to stink in the moment. But overall, it's going to be a good thing. Don't let imposter syndrome stop you or deter you from taking that next step because it's nonsense. Everyone is an imposter until they're not. So really, no one's an imposter. You just have to go and do it. All right. You're not in college until you're in college. So what? We shouldn't. Nobody should go to college because we're imposters. Nonsense. Nonsense. So get out there and give it your all. Know you're going to give it your all and go go for that promotion. Accept that promotion. Start that business if it's responsible <laughs> and give it your best shot. OK, if you're being honest with yourself and you're not going to give it your best shot, then maybe you are an imposter. Right. I'm a millionaire, but, you know, you, you don't have two, two nickels to rub together and you don't plan on doing the work. All right. You're an imposter millionaire. Fine. Um, but if you're being honest with yourself, you're not an imposter. Get out there, make it happen, okay? You're not an imposter. You are that person. Now let's get to the questions. Question one. I have a coworker who is my work friend, but we don't hang out outside of work. I've noticed they use my emails, especially the ones that require a lot of verbiage and are very long with specific information for the recipient. Then they slap their name at the bottom and send it to her customers at work. I really worked hard and created several drafts to perfect this email for myself, and it seems she may be too lazy to come up with one on her own, so she uses mine and just searched in the sent folder of the shared email file. We all use the same marketing address, so we have access to that, but we do sign our own names at the bottom. Am I making a big deal? How should I confront her without making this awkward? 
All right, now this is interesting because the fact is when it comes to marketing campaigns and, and crafting an email, and I got to tell you, my wife is a master at this. She's a writer, so she should be. So, you know, she'll tell you, she, she was like, I hated being a salesperson, but she always was a salesperson. She was a phenomenal writer. So she leaned on it. So you want to talk about imposter syndrome? Forget about it. She's a great writer. So she leaned on that for her sales aspect of things, right? So marketing and right crafting this email, she worked really hard on crafting an email and somebody just decided to steal her email. And I use that word very, very carefully and put their name on the bottom of it and just send it out. Now, you're all in the same company, you're all rowing the boat, you all wanna make sales, you all want the company to be successful. So as an employee and as the crafter of this clearly very effective and good email if other people want to utilize it. How do you go about this? All right. There are ways to use this to your advantage. You could make a giant stink about this and say, she stole my email. He stole my email. This is not fair. And, you know, run around. Or you could be a little bit more shrew about this, you know, a little bit more art of warish about this and really use this to your advantage. Okay. And this is what I would tell anybody to do. And honestly, if, if I was the owner of this company or I was the manager of this company I, and, and this person came to me and started complaining about this, I would say, let's let's re, let's re reframe this. Instead of accusing this person of stealing and instead of complaining about this, let's totally reframe this. Let's say that you wrote an amazing email and let's have you run a meeting on how you came up with this way. OK, so as the employee, why don't you instead of you know, sticking your, your fingers in your ears and throwing a temper tantrum to your boss, which by the way, I totally understand why you would want to do that. You worked really hard on this email, okay? And people are using it and they may be getting pats on the back about their responses to this email, but it's your email, right? It's your writing. That's not nice. That's not great. So why don't you go to your manager or go to your boss or go to somebody that you know will hear this, all right? Don't just throw it out there. And why don't you say, hey, listen, I wrote this great this marketing email. It seems to be really effective. So much so that I know some of the other people have been using the verbiage on it to send out their emails. I'd like to sit down with you and show it to you and, sh and maybe go through the analytics of how it's worked. And maybe we could do a workshop with the rest of the company on this email or other people that do the, the marketing emails. And we can go through how I wrote this, how I came up with this. And maybe we can craft three or four versions of this together you know, if you'd like, I could run it or I could just be a part of the team going through it and we could craft some other ways that we could write this. So we're not all sending out the same exact email, but at least something similar. Now you've shown your team player, you've gone to management and showed them you came up with this email. So they know you're very valuable, but over and you're showing leadership skills. So now if a director of marketing position opens up at this firm, well, your, your hat's already in the ring, whether you like it or not, you know, because you, you're, you're showing these leadership skills. You have the skills to craft verbiage like this. So it's a totally different reframing of the situation, right? You're taking this really crappy situation of somebody stealing your work, but now you're pivoting it and using it as now you're a teacher. Okay. You're not having your work stolen. You're actually teaching your coworkers better ways to craft their emails. And that is a great way to show management, not only you're a team player, but you're a leader of the organization. And when promotion time comes and bonus time comes, or worse off, if layoff time comes, it's a lot easier to keep the person that crafts those emails and other people steal from, because if they have to lay people off, they can go get minimum wage people to copy and paste your emails and put their name on it. You see what I'm saying? So. Don't look at this as a terrible situation. Look at this as a positive situation that you could really use to your advantage. All right, let's get to the next question. Question two. <clears throat> this one's an interesting one. I, I might have to use some bleeps and bops, so bear with me. I have to stay professional about this as I am a department head. Let's remember that, a department head. Talking to people is part of my job, so that's fine. Come to me with any work-related question or problem, and I am 100% there to help and will do so in a professional and courteous manner. That's going to be hard to believe as we keep reading this, just putting that out there. But no, I don't want to hear about your weekend. I don't want to hear about your personal drama. And no, I don't want to be your pal. I'm not here to make friends. 
I'm there to get stuff done. And I don't really, by the way, I've, I've edited this. The stuffs were a lot of other words. And I don't really like people anyway. I've tried subtle hints like, hey, I'm really busy right now, to some not so huddle hints like flat out ignoring them as a manager, or just giving them annoyed look and turning around without answering. Okay. I don't know what else to do while staying professional. I'm about to tell all of them just to F off, again, that was an edit, and leave me alone. Any advice? There are also some egotistical narcissists there. There are some other egotistical narcissists there, I think is the right way to frame that, that try to micromanage every little thing. And they're not even in my department. Them I have not been so nice to, especially because half the stuff they say is just plain wrong. I don't want these bad habits spreading, telling them to F off also. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Focus on what you're doing. No one in my department needs a babysitter, and especially not you. Yet they keep pulling the same stuff. I'm about to say F it and quit. Any advice for these people? Yeah, uh, I'd let this guy quit. <laughs> I mean, look. One, this is this is this was a Reddit thread, so this person was probably just blowing off some steam. Okay, so I, I totally can sympathize with that. I, I've had that happen in sessions where somebody just needs to vent and they want to go off. Understandable. So if that's the case, I apologize for making light of the situation. We've all had that happen. But if this is real, you're a manager, you're a department head. You can't be acting like this. Okay. Part of the gig is is your people and caring about your people. So just hearing about their weekend, is that so hard, right? That's part of managing. These are people's lives. They work here. You like I, I would love to give this guy an assessment because they're clearly not a sociable person. They want to be an introvert. And their job should probably reflect that. And it sounds like they're not in a position that, that has that. So changing of career is probably worth it. So I would give this person the, the counsel that they should seek a different position and seek go, go somewhere else. But also, if you're the owner of this business or the man or the hiring manager or HR or his superior or her superior, you're going to have to look a little inward here and say, "Why did you promote this person to this position?" This sounds like the Michael Scott rule to me. And if you know what the Michael Scott theory is, it's you eventually get promoted to a point where you're no longer effective, and I feel like that that's where this person is. They might have been a dynamite employee all the way up to where they are now so at some point you got to just cut your bait and say listen you, you've hit your you've hit your max here it's it's time to to maybe go um they're clearly not happy there you're not going to be happy they're they're probably creating a toxic work environment for you and at some point you you, you both got to have like an honest conversation and i think that's the conversation of like are you happy here you know maybe give them a nice severance package if they've had like years of of, of great service with you um, or hear them out. Like maybe there's something going on at, at home and maybe they've always been a great employee and, and great friend of employees. And like now all of a sudden they've turned around, but this is a toxic employee. And at some point you have to worry about your other employees and, and how they affect th them. You know, you can't just worry about the one. You have to worry about the, the totality of them. So if there's one person like this affecting, let's say the office has 15 people. One person can ruin an office for the other 14. By telling this person, hey, listen, you know, we're going to give you a severance package and we'll write you a great recommendation letter is the best thing you can do not only for them, but for the other 14 as well. I hate to even talk like that because it sounds very flippant, but this person is clearly very unhappy with where they are. So much so that they said it at the end, they're about to quit. So, you know, addition by subtraction for everybody in this situation sounds like the best bet. Um, also, like I said, I watered that down quite a bit. It was very, very angry. Um, anyway, let's get to our final question. Uh, keep it short because we're already over. My job is asking me to resign. Both of my grandparents died. Oh, and I haven't even used my six bereavement days yet. I don't know the funeral dates, and he said if I can't figure it out, then I have to resign. But he is just asking me to resign so it doesn't look bad on them, and and then I can't apply for unemployment. Okay, uh, this is a, this is an easy one. Absolutely, do not resign. You know, unless you feel like this this is not you know the place for you. 
you, you never resign because your boss tells you to resign. And by the way, if you do feel like you need to resign, get that in writing that he's telling you to resign. Have him write you an email, whatever. So you have that for legal purposes because that is not a resignation. He is telling you you're fired. Okay, and he doesn't want to pay unemployment, or she doesn't want to pay unemployment. That is what's going on here. This is this is a game right now. All right, so that's not cool at all. Whenever somebody tells you to quit or resign, especially when it's you're talking about bereavement days and grandparents, I'm so sorry. Like you're going through it already. Like that's awful. This is where leadership and management and working for the right owner is so so important, and that's something we're going to talk about. If you have any questions about like finding the right boss and finding the right owner while you're in the hiring process, please message me, email or DM me. Remember, it's Jane, at James Fenimore underscore or info at FennerPrices.com because you don't want to find yourself in a position like this. It's toxic. It's terrible. It's awful. You want to be excited for who you work for. You know, this is just this is very, very predatory and very disgusting. Absolutely do not resign. If you do choose because it's a terrible work environment that you're going to just go that route, have this person email you and say this in writing and go to a lawyer first and say, I want to resign because it's a toxic place. How, what do I get this guy to say so I can still collect unemployment when I quit? Um, because this is this is nonsense. This is so not right and so, so awful. So um, definitely speak to a legal representative before you quit because this is basically you're being fired without being fired. So... They, they can claim, they can deny your unemployment when, when you ask to go on it. All right. I'm sorry to end on a sour note like that, but I really hope you take my advice. And I really hope you don't, you haven't quit already because you're entitled to at least unemployment uh, for a short while while you search for another job. And next time, hopefully you learn from this. Hopefully you look for a great boss and a great organization that's going to respect something like when your grandparents pass away. Because at the end of the day, your workplace is your family during the day, and they have to, you have to take care of each other. And you should want to care about what they did on the weekend, like like uh, question number two candidate. All right, that's it for today. Great seeing you. We'll see you next week. I'm James Fenimore at James Fenimore underscore info at Fenimore.com. You can find me Fenimore.com, James Fenimore.com. If you need anything at all, please hit me up. Look forward to hearing from you, and I'll see you next week.